With night comes trepidation, for those creatures that roam in darkness will prey on the living, and soon all will experience the terror at Collinwood. Wicked scared yet? Yeah, you better be wicked scared. It's scary over here. Hey, I am from Massachusetts. Uh, anyway, um, before we get to today's show, I have some uh, news for you. And typically at the beginning of the show, I talk about Dark Shadows news, but this is not specifically a Dark Shadows related news piece, but I am sharing it because it was uh, a piece that was shared with me by a previous guest who was on the show. Uh, you heard him in episode 28, and it was Jim Beard, who was the editor of Running Home to Shadows. And he has a new book that is part of his today's Grown Up Kids series of pop culture nostalgia books books, and this one is called Rising Sun Reruns. From the 1960s to the 1990s, children in the West were gifted with a bounty of amazing TV shows to watch and enjoy, but it wasn't nearly enough to satisfy their voracious appetites for adventure. It took an intriguing immigration of imported shows from the East to fill their afternoons with all the fun and fantasy they craved, grab a TV tray, and hunker down in the family den with a group of grown-up kids as they reminisce about their favorite exotic Japanese TV shows of yore in the pages, you will find glowing memories of flights of fancies such as Ultraman, Johnny Sacco and his flying robot, Astro Boy, Battle of the Planets, Space Giants, Speed Racer, Robotech, and many, many more, including a few you may never even heard of. Writer, editor Jim Beard adds to his memories from today's Grown Up Kids series of pop culture nostalgia books with Rising Sun reruns, a tantalizing trip into the past when discovering a strange show from Japan alongside your other favorite series was not a weird thing at all. It was downright wonderful. So you can find this book on Amazon. Head on over there. It's Rising Sun Reruns. Jim has done an amazing job with the series of books that he's put out devoted to many of our favorites growing up. And uh, you certainly will want to add this one to your collections. So thank you very much for sharing that, Jim. Folks, uh, I'm going to jump right in here because we've got a lot to talk about. But before we do that, please do make sure to subscribe to the podcast. If you're listening on Apple Podcasts, give us a review, give us a rating, or on Amazon. I don't think we have any ratings on Amazon Music yet. So if you listen to the show on Amazon, give us a give us a rating and a review. I might be looking in the wrong place. I, I don't know. Anyway, on with the show. Welcome to Terror at Collinwood Tis I, your hostess, Penny Dreadful, aka Danielle. And I am thrilled to have three amazing guests here today. Two of them are returning guests. One of them now has the record for being uh, on Terror at Collinwood more than any other guest I've had on. And it is, of course, the amazing Mary O'Leary, who is the producer and director of Dark Shadows and Beyond, the Jonathan Frid story. She's joined by Will McKinley, who you heard in a previous episode. And uh, Will also worked with Jonathan Frid on his one-man shows. He is the promotions director, writer, producer, and digital marketing consultant for the documentary and we're joined also by a first timer here at Terror at Collinwood, Michael Giglio, who is the editor and post-production supervisor on the documentary. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much. Thanks, Danielle. My Thank pleasure. You, it's great, great having you back. So, Mary, first before before anything else, I want to I want to congratulate you on winning the best director award at the seattle film festival you have best director for documentary feature and that's your first documentary uh that you've made so congratulations to tell us a little bit about winning this award thank you it was an honor to receive it i was thrilled to be able to go up and make an award speech because while we have won 20 awards on the film festival circuit ranging from producing directing to editing most of these have been online festivals due to the COVID situation. I did have one live event I went to in Hagerstown, Maryland in March, but this was the second live film festival and the first where I actually won an award and went up to make the speech. I was thrilled um, that the two producers of the event, William Wayne and Michael Ray, 
ran a terrific festival, produced it really well. And I was just delighted to be a part of it. And you made a speech, uh, you say, so what was the what was the speech like? Well, basically, I took the opportunity for the first time to thank all the crews because I was in different cities to film interviews, New York, Los Angeles, Memphis, and to locations in Ontario. And I acknowledged my different teams and I acknowledged executive producer Jim Pearson and Michael, who you're having in this podcast, and also the Dark Shadows fans for their tremendous support and praise of the documentary. And finally, I just said to Jonathan, gifted actor who was a kind, generous person, and I was so honored to be able to do this documentary. And th- this was the first time you've been uh, at an award ceremony since the, the daytime Emmys, right? Yes, it was a delight to be at the daytime Emmys. I have been before, I actually have seven daytime Emmy awards for working on soap operas. Uh, that was my career for over 30 years. And it was quite an amazing experience to be back at the Daytime Emmy Awards, but this time for my first documentary. And it was great to see people that I've worked with over the years and have reunions with them, including an actor named Ted King, who the last time we ran into each other, we both weren't working. This time we were both nominated for, uh, he was her guest star on a soap opera. And I, of course, for the documentary. Uh, so that was, uh, that was a wonderful evening, I must say. Now, M- Michael, uh, this is your first time here on Terror at Collinwood, but tell us, uh, you know, about how you and Mary uh, met and uh, what your involvement was in the documentary. Well, yeah, so uh, it was a pleasure working with Mary. And ironically, we were introduced through Will and um, Will and I were colleagues for some time uh, working on different projects for different clients. And um, I remember uh we had worked on a project towards the end of the pandemic when people were starting to work again and it was a complete remote shoot i don't know will if you remember uh this project where it was the first time we did a project and all of the people were sending in iphone videos yes Uh, and in the beginning of the meetings we were like i don't know how this is gonna go this can't this might not be the greatest project we've ever worked on together and then I think after um, a few creative thoughts between Will and I, we really started nailing it home. And um, we both enjoyed the project by the end of it. And uh, it ended with him asking if I would like, uh, if he can introduce me with Mary. And um, Mary and I had a few conversations where we, I heard her wants and needs and um, I, I knew my capabilities and we were able to strike a, a working relationship together to work on the documentary. I mean, one thing that, uh, you know, I've worked with Mike for a number of years and, and you know, he's like uh, I, in baseball, you call it like a like a, a three tool player. You know, he can do he's a great editor. He's a great graphic designer and artist. And, you know, he also shoots and, you know, he did all of that. Basically, I ba- I said to Mary, this is the perfect guy for, I think, what you need to do with this documentary. And I'm just, you know, really glad that it all worked out. So am I. It was was wonderful for me because Michael did not know Dark Shadows or Jonathan Frid. So he had that objective eye that was super helpful. And also in addition to the skills that Will mentioned, music. Michael is a musician. And when we started working on choices of music, it was just a great fun adventure. And he, he was came up with so many great suggestions. Mike, so you you hadn't watched Dark Shadows. Had you heard of it at least prior to that? Um, I heard of it as the the remake, um, but I had never watched it. And then but I, just, I remember commercials for it, um, I guess. Mm-hmm. And then um, the more that I learned through Mary about him, the more I realized I must have come across Jonathan before, just because I, I, I think the voice struck a chord with me I, and where there was a memory, but I had no recollection uh, or, or or knowledge of work that he had done as we worked on it. So it was interesting that Mar- Mary having, you know, her business experience with Jonathan and such a tight relationship over the years and all the uh, archival footage and all the facts and uh, behind the scenes stories, there was so much there. And then 
it was fun for me to kind of learn about him in such a capacity and then be able to say, OK, well, these are some great passionate stories, but maybe some of them go off tangent sometimes. So it was nice to kind of that Mary was so willing to hear my point of view. Um, and I kept thinking if someone else didn't know about Jonathan, would they get it? And um, so I, I was trying to teach all the interesting things that I had learned through Mary through the edit um, to make sure it was clear and understood from someone who may have not um, who was in my similar shoes as me and did not know. You know, and that's that's something that, you know, we always do in 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 video. It's like show it to somebody who doesn't have an emotional connection to it. Right. Mm -hmm. Because they're able to be objective and tell you what works and what doesn't and what's boring and what's interesting. And, you know, so that was great that Mike, you know, was committed to doing a great documentary, but not necessarily thinking from the perspective of a fan who's like, oh, but you have to mention whatever. You know? Right. Right. Yeah. And that is a great perspective to have uh, and to see it through the eyes of, of those who may be watching it for the first time. And oh, who, what is this all about? And, uh, you know, having no prior knowledge of it. So definitely. Um, and you've designed some graphics as well for the documentary. So uh, what graphics did you design? So, um, it starts with um, the opening title sequence. You know, um, we wanted to set the tone there. And um, there was it was quite a, a juxtaposition of, of hearing the voiceover describe a fictional character, but really we were talking about the man, Jonathan, right? So we wanted to create graphics that went in and out of him being Barnabas to him, his real life. So it's um, an outline of the Players Guild meshing into, um, you know, the house from Dark Shadows. Then, you know, it's maybe his cane and his ring with a newspaper and a drink. So it kind of, we wanted to show that the turmoils that Barnabas had are, are similar turmoils that Jonathan had. Um, and I think you could see that through the documentary. And we wanted to nail that that feeling in right in the opening. So you can get that like every time we reference a vampire, it's really Jonathan in this television world, like kind of being um, out of place since he was so used to theater and and and, and performing live. So it was this back and forth feeling. And um, some of the other things we had created is just the times when we had archival footage that was old and didn't have video with it. So we wanted to create visual ways to keep it stunning, um, but yet still get the value from those pieces. Uh, and that's, you know, where we got Ian Buchanan to read the voiceovers. We needed to create something beautiful for that. And, and Mary is lucky enough to have all these handwritten letters from Jonathan, the graphics we created are actually Jonathan's handwriting in the documentary. It's not a recreation of it. It's um, so it was a fun way to show off like a true piece of uh, history. And I remember Mary and I would talk, we're talking regularly during the production on the documentary and the post. And the first thing I ever saw was the open that Mike did. And I remember like being like, holy mackerel, this is really good. This is going to be a good documentary. And it, it, of course, it, that's what it turned out to be. Um, did, did you all find the process of, of working together very organic? Was it or was it what were some of the challenges that you faced in doing it? A challenge for me was that Michael was in New Jersey and I was in Los Angeles and we did everything over the computer. And during my years of working in soap opera, I was in many edit rooms with different editors you were right next to each other. And there was just a back and forth that really helped in the process. So this was a very, very unique experience for me. And we would see each other on the computer, but we never actually met face to face until he came to Los Angeles for the Daytime Emmy Awards. Mm -hmm. uh, as the final product shows, it, it did come off. It was just uh, an adjustment for me to work that way. If I could add to that, uh, being on so many, because we were so far away, it was important we communicated every day um, and sometimes for hours, right? Uh, because right. there was no quick, quick way of doing it. So we had to kind of get it all done. And, um, you know, over that course of time, you know, Mary and I, I think, became very good friends. I consider Mary a great friend now, as opposed to a colleague. It's, you know, we share about our families because there's just so much time, especially because we're on two different coasts. So what, what, what time works for Mary is not always good for me. And then really there's that time, which is the end of the night for me and the evening for her, where we did a lot of our work and it's 
as far as part of the process, I thought it was interesting, Mary, that um, because of this workflow, we almost had every night to have our thoughts to ourselves because it was so cumbersome to be able to share a whole edit with Mary so she could review it, that uh, it, we almost had our time to be patient with our opinions instead of reacting. And I, I thought that it helped me maybe communicate my thoughts to Mary and then Mary to kind of really solidify what the end picture would be. Yes, Michael, I think, well, thank you so much. I consider you a dear friend. We, while working with Michael, it, his wife was pregnant and gave birth to their second daughter. Oh, so wow. I was so part mm -hmm. of that. Um, he also had his uh, little daughter who was in kindergarten online in the other room and uh, and his, his wife working her job too in the other room. So it, it was it's quite a family affair. <laughs> We always said there should be a documentary about making the documentary. <laughs> there was so much chaos uh, from every angle. Uh, every day, we one of us had a story to share. Oh, you'll never believe what happened. Right. And then um, but it was just funny. We just kept trucking along and uh, all that other stuff aside and, and really were able to, to hit our goals and, um, and and get this project finished. But it was there was always something from rain season bringing me floods, having a baby, just tons of stuff uh, Mary and I were sharing. So interesting time. Yes. Are you working on uh, on anything right now, uh, Michael? Um, yeah, I have a couple of side projects. Mm -hmm. A lot of my work is for small small businesses, um, marketing, but I have mm -hmm. um, two big projects in the works. One of them is a documentary about 90s hip hop um, oh, okay. through the eyes of some people who, who were in it at the time. And um, we're parlaying that idea to create more music based entertainment. And, and we're, we're creating um, a drama series about Harlem in uh, the 1980s uh, about this roller skating rink and um, some of the things that became famous through that club, oh, wow. um, which is interesting. Um, it's almost like a fictional doc. It's a, it's based on true stories. So uh, I'm really taking the idea of, of working on the documentary. And I, it was my first Dark Shadows and Beyond was my first documentary mm -hmm. uh, and I loved it. So now I'm trying to find more opportunities and that's why I'm bringing these other projects on. And um, I got the taste of those Emmys and I, I, I want to keep going. <laughs> <laughs> One Wonderful. of these days. Yeah. And um, the story's not done. We're going to keep going until we get one. And thanks to Mike, this may be the first ever podcast that talks about dark shadows and hip hop on the same oh, show. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Quite, well, quite the portfolio. Well, well, and we and we are all today celebrating as we record this October 5th, 2022. Today is the, the first anniversary of the documentary's release. So congratulations, guys. Yes, Thank indeed. You. Yes. And, and to commemorate that, something very uh, exciting uh, is happening, and that's sort of uh, part of what we're going to be talking about here, is the launch of the Jonathan Frid documentary website. Holy moly, so tell us about the Jonathan Frid website. Well, I am thrilled to be able to give a gift to the fans because they have been so supportive of the documentary and oftentimes inquiring about footage that didn't make it into the documentary because, uh, yes, when, when it was first put together, it was over two hours long. So we had to, as the expression goes, leave scenes on the cutting room floor. And I said, well, this will be the opportunity to show some of that footage in its raw form. So actually the fans will be able to see a bit of the process that Michael and I went through. You'll see time code on the screen, use things, things might be jump cut, the color it might not be perfect, the audio might not be perfect because these were in their raw stages and then had to make decisions along the way about what to focus on. So I hope um, everybody is thrilled. It, it also really is not only to promote the documentary, but continue the legacy of Jonathan Frid. Fantastic. Whose idea was it to, to launch a website? Uh, Will was the one that asked me if I was going to do it. And I said, I had been thinking about it, but I wasn't sure. So he made talked, it happen. He talked her into it. <laughs> Over one of our many, like Mike, I would tend to talk to Mary like late at night, which is early for her and, and late for me. And, you know, we just had so many occasions where people were, you know, like I do the Twitter for the documentary and I was sharing links to like, just watch it so people could see all the places where they could stream it. And I said to Mary, you know, you should have a site 
where people can see the trailer, where people can find all the links to stream the documentary and learn about the people like you who worked on it and Mike. And um, so it just sort of became something that was an obvious decision. And luckily, I knew a really, really good web designer who I had met about 10 years ago on Twitter named Lauren Milberger. And one of the things I love about Lauren, she did a fabulous job on this website. But she is, she's not a dark, like Mike, she's not a Dark Shadows fan, but she's very much, she identifies as a fan. She has the fan perspective. So, you know, she's a great fan of like, she's an actress as well and a great fan of Burns and Allen. And she does a show as great as Gracie Allen. She does a fabulous like Gracie Allen. And, you know, she hosted a podcast about Murphy Brown. She hosted a podcast about Harrison Ford. So she came at this with a fan perspective. So she knew what we were trying to achieve. Would you agree with that, Mary? Yes. Um, She was able through conversation to gain insight on what we're looking for and just created a beautiful website for us. We should say it too. Yeah, so should we should say jonathanfrid.org. Yes, <laughs> jonathanfrid.org. I will put a link to, to the uh, website in the in the show notes. Uh, absolutely. But yeah, what so what are some of so there there's going to be footage on the website that didn't make the final cut uh, in the documentary, which is exciting. Uh, what what else can we expect to see on the um, Jonathan Frid website? Well, in addition to the video clips, which are under what we call the vault. Um, and in there, uh, there are some of Jonathan's favorite scenes from Dark Shadows. But there's also in the 1980s when he was in Arsenic and Lace, both on Broadway and the national tour, there were a number of times he was interviewed. So I have a couple of his appearance on talk shows during his Arsenic and Lace period. Um, we didn't use the generation gap. There's two episodes he was in. So one of them is now on the website. And there's also, again, as I was mentioning, footage that didn't make it so part of a piece of David Selby's interview, a piece of Marie Wallace, where she talks about Jonathan's friendship with Louis Edmonds. So there's little, little tiny um, vignettes and certainly of Jonathan too at some festivals. So it, it, it's a broad range of material that I think the fans will really enjoy. I was poking uh, around on the website last night uh, when uh, Will sent me the uh, information about it. And I saw some really exciting things there. Uh, for example, there's some merch merchandise, uh, which was exciting to see. So can you tell us about some of the merchandise that you'll be offering at the website? Well, and this is also where our friend uh, Wallace McBride, better known as Cousin Barnabas on Twitter, the Collins Port Historical Society, we found a original ad for Jonathan Fritz Halloween Hotline that he did. It yes. was a, it was a, it was a like crazy 1-800 call-in number that he did in 1991 yeah. for MCI. And so we found an ad for that and Wallace laid it out and we, you know, you can now get it on t-shirts and mugs and, and stickers and pins and, you know, spiral notebooks and, and all of this stuff. And we hope, you know, we just sort of shared this with people on social media within the last couple of days. Um, you know, as you know, with these like t-shirt sites online, we make a small percentage of the actual sales, but all of it goes to help Mary, who is the, you know, the sole funder of these endeavors to continue to tell Jonathan's story. So we definitely appreciate, um, you know, folks checking it out and, and hopefully buying a shirt. And we have lots of ideas for other things that we could do. And we hope we'll get a chance to share them with folks. Right, Mary? Yes, we definitely have reached out to uh, the artist, Sherlock Watson. Yes, Sherlock. She has submitted some pieces of art that we would like to uh, use on T-shirts. So one item at a time. (laughs) And we have, yeah, um, and we have lots of great plans. And we think that, you know, folks will really like what's up there now and the next piece of art, which is all ready to go. So keep an eye out for that. Um, One of the things that was super fun about this was that this website, in a sense, was like 
a reunion of Clunes Associates, which was the name of the you know company that Jonathan and Mary had together in the 80s. I met Mary and started working with her when I was like 15 years old. And um, it has been a long time since we worked together on a project. And this is really the first professional collaboration that we've had since the 1980s. And it was weird because, you know, it's like 35 or whatever years later. And we just kind of fell back into that same, you know, work dynamic. And, you know, uh, we even to some extent had Jonathan in mind on every decision that we made, you know, I would be like, Jonathan would hate this or, or <laughs> John, or Mary would say, that's what Jonathan would do. And right. I mean, it was like, he was kind of there with us in a sense. Yes. I had his picture taped on my computer and it's where, where he, you know, he's looking straight at me. And so I thought, yes, that's what you would like. You don't want to see a lot of fangs. <laughs> <laughs> right. No fangs and nothing cheesy. And, you know, make sure he looks handsome. And it's uh, in a way, it's kind of, um, you know, this grew when we first talked about this six months ago, it was just going to be like, put the trailer up, whatever, some information about how it was made and boom, that was it. And like every project we ever did with Jonathan, it grew, you know, it expanded, the scope expanded. And, you know, we tried a bunch of things and tried them again and tried them again and tried to make it perfect. And it very much took on the characteristics of a you know, a Jonathan Fred project, even though he's not here to tell us what to do. But his uh, spirit is definitely there. Uh, and that, uh, when you look at the website, it's just magnificent. Um, and I'm sure he would be really proud of of your efforts on his behalf. Uh, and in you. fact, I was trying to en- was trying to encourage Will and uh, Mary to launch their own uh, podcast because I think they would be fantastic podcast hosts with all of their stories they have about uh, working with Jonathan and and everything a, a Jonathan Fred podcast. That's all. That's all I'm going to say, guys. <laughs> if we did that, is that like is that then considered a spinoff of Terror at Collinwood? So are we <laughs> are we in the Penny Dreadful cinematic universe? If we oh, do this, indeed, yes, yes. <laughs> and we can have crossovers at like during Sweeps Week. And stuff. that would be amazing. I would be all about that. So, all right. Well, you know, you mentioned this. Um, Halloween hotline with MCI. And I remember back in 91 calling that hotline over and over again to hear Jonathan tell uh, the legend of Sleepy Hollow, a, a very, you know, abridged version of it, but it was really cool. And I even held my tape recorder up to the telephone <laughs> so that I could record him telling the story. And I still, uh, somewhere, I still have that cassette tape somewhere, but the two of you, uh, Will and, and Mary, were there when Jonathan recorded this, which is incredible. Uh, when you told me that, that blew my mind. So can you talk a little bit about that? Yes. Um, I had gotten the call from a representative at MCI that they had this idea to, to promote uh, market MCI communications by having Jonathan Frid, ex Barnabas Collins, do some type of uh, short promotional item. Jonathan was interested, but said he wanted to choose the material because many years ago when he had done commercials, they were often saying, Mr. Frid, do your thing. And he said, I don't have a thing. I was an actor playing the role of a vampire. So he didn't want to be a vampire. And so he, a year before in October, 1990, he had done the legend of Sleepy Hollow inside the Dutch church in Tarrytown. So he came up with the idea, well, what if we use a, uh, that story? But obviously they said no more than three minutes. So worked a long time to get it down to three minutes. And as it was getting close, in retrospect, looking back now, Jonathan was really getting nervous about it. And I remember him telling me a story that he wasn't good at doing voiceover work for commercials. He in 1972, had been hired by General Mills to do a 30-second commercial voiceover for one of their new products, something called Dictators. <laughs> and they thought it would be very quick recording, but he kept stumbling and, and would do it over and over again. And he just said, I'm not good in his head. He felt he wasn't good at that. He said, 
the man to get is Thayer David. Thayer was great at doing voiceovers for commercials. So I think a part of Jonathan was really nervous about doing this. He wanted to do it because in a way it was going to promote his one man show. But still underneath, again, as I say, in retrospect, I think he was very nervous and really wanted it to go well. And um, he was a perfectionist. <laughs> and I think that particular evening, and Will can attest to this, that a, he really put on his perfectionist streak and that didn't necessarily make it go quickly. <laughs> yeah. I mean, so basically like <clears throat> at that point now, you know, I had mentioned I had started to work with Jonathan and Mary when I was a high school student. Now this is early nineties. So I've already working and I was working at a like production company agency. And so, you know, Mary and Jonathan asked me to put together some sound effects for this, which I did with a sound designer named Dave Christenberry, who did the sound design for Jonathan's story, Dead Call, that's excerpted in the documentary, and Danielle, that you used on a previous episode. So they had a relationship with Dave, and Dave and I were also working together on our like corporate stuff. And so we put together all these sound effects. I brought them to the this it was like an expensive New York City sound studio. The client also, I, I don't think knew he was she was young and I don't think she had any clue who this man was and, you know, what Dark Shadows was. And she figured this is a three minute thing. We're going to bang it out hour of time and then we'll go, you know, whatever we will be done. And Jonathan started like obsessing about the sound effects and he wanted to roll them in live while he was recording. And I was like, Jonathan, that's what you did on Dark Shadows like 30 years ago. You don't have to do that anymore. We have editing like you don't have to do it all in one take start to finish. And the client started to get like worried because we were going over time. So, you know, I basically sort of pulled her aside and was like, here's what we're going to do. We're going to get this done and everyone's going to be happy. And we basically talked Jonathan out of being, you know, sort of the, you know, producer, director, actor hat that he had put on. And I was like, look, just get the track down. You and Mary go out for dinner. We'll cut it. You're going to love it. And I sat down with the engineer, we cut it with the effects and it turned out great. And I think the client ended up happy. Would you agree with that, Mary? Yes, the client was very happy. Um, as a matter of fact, two years later in 1993, they did another promotional campaign. That time it was 1-800-COLLECT with actor Phil Hartman and Arsenio Hall. So they really it did well for them. So they did it for another part uh, that we're needing to promote a couple of years later. So that's why it's sort of like for us, it's kind of a it was a memorable, you know, night and a memorable experience. And this is, of course, you don't you'll never know any of this listening to the recording because it's just a fun, spooky, you know, recording. But there's a little bit of a legend beyond, you know, behind the Halloween hotline. Yeah. And thank you for for sharing that. And uh, <laughs> speaking of, thank you also to Mary for sharing uh, the audio clip, which you will be hearing at the end of this episode. So you will get to hear Jonathan Frid reading uh, the legend of Sleepy Hollow at the end of this episode, just in time for October of uh, 2022 here. Um, so this this premiered in, on October 28th, 1991. One, but um, there's uh, a new Halloween hotline for 2022. What's this all about? <laughs> well, we're we're you know um, since we have the website and you know we're and we're very open. You know, we hope that the fans will will weigh in and sit, talk about like what they would like to see and whatever. But so our idea for this year to celebrate is to create new episodes of the Halloween hotline um, and post them over Halloween weekend uh, this year for four days. And we're also going to work again with Dave Christenberry, who did, you know, the effects 31 years ago. So it is very much like a sort of reunion, John, you know, rare recordings of Jonathan's Reader's Theater performances that folks haven't heard. So, you know, we think that will be, uh, you know, an exciting way to leverage the website and also sort of remember Jonathan during a month, Mary, that was his like, I mean, Jonathan was to October, like, like Santa Claus is to <laughs> December. Um, it was his busiest month, wasn't it? 
Yes. October was when Jonathan had the most bookings. It was a very popular time for people to make the request. And oftentimes I had to say, we're already booked. <laughs> Wait till next year. And that was the Although- October, right? October was when we did the first ever performance, public performance of Jonathan Frid's Fools and Fiends. At yes, the day co- two was yeah, October 18th, 1986 in Newport, Rhode Island. As sorry, I cut you off there, Will. No. Uh, and on the campus was the house that was Collinwood. Which, when I think about my life, the fact that I, as a teenager, as a Teenage Dark Shadows fan, ended up working for Jonathan Frid and the and the debut of the project that we worked together took place at Collinwood. I mean, that, not that it took place at the house, but it took place on the grounds where the house was. That's about the strangest and coolest way it could have all turned out, you know? For sure, for sure. Um, now, before we um, we wrap up here, um, they are going to be airing House of Dark Shadows on Friday, October 29th at 6.15 p.m. Eastern time on TCM, Turner Classic Movies. Uh, And something uh, exciting will be happening during that uh, airing. Want to talk about that a little bit? Yes. For folks who are on Twitter, and I know not everybody is, but for folks who are on Twitter, if you follow the Jonathan Frid Doc account, we'll be live tweeting TCM's broadcast of House of Dark Shadows on Friday, October 29th at 6.15 p.m. Eastern. So look for our tweets um, you know, we'll share some like fun facts about the movie history, some photos, and uh, it's always a good time. And as I've said before, I think on this podcast, House of Dark Shadows is my favorite iteration of Dark Shadows ever. So I will enjoy doing these tweets. Did what did Jonathan think of the fact that that was your favorite iteration of Dark Shadows? Uh, he, <laughs> he had no problem with telling me that I was wrong. <laughs> Um, he strenuously disagreed with me (laughs) and, you know, I mean, but I've, uh, whatever, you know, it's, it's always like the first thing you see and, you know, not to go off course, but like I had never, I'm watching the pre Barnabas episodes. Now I, in my 40 years of being a dark shadows fan had never seen a single one of them because Jonathan wasn't in it. Mm -hmm. Um, Jonathan was really the draw of dark shadows for me. And, I really loved that movie and I loved how scary it was and I loved how creepy it was. So yeah, I always enjoy tweeting when it's on TCM and there's a, a group on on uh, Twitter called TCM Party, hashtag TCM Party. And, you know, so we'll be tagging our tweets with TCM Party as well. So definitely join in. That should, that should be fun. Well, I think I think Rob Zombie would agree with you. He's he, he's a big fan of of House of Dark Shadows in terms of it being his preferred version of Dark Shadows. He did some some kind of I'm, I'm t- saying this because Will is uh, this is an audio only episode, but Will's background is the uh, yes. Munster's house uh, in the background there. So I'm then, crossing the streams by using a Munster's background on a Dark Shadows podcast. I'm sorry. But, <laughs> the Munsters meet the Collins family. I I want this to happen. All right. Well, uh, I want to thank the three of you uh, for coming on uh, to join me here on Terror at Collinwood. Uh, And do do you have any closing uh, thoughts or statements you'd like to make? I just want to say thank you, Danielle, for letting me come on for the third time as your guest to tell everyone about the new website. I really want everyone to go to jonathanfrid.org Uh, and enjoy. And I, again, want to say it is a gift to the fans and I hope they do love it. Well, thank you, Mary. It is my pleasure to have you on. Uh, You always have such amazing insights to share and I uh, I really appreciate you uh, joining me here. And I I would say, you know, uh, for, for all of the fans out there, I'm so struck by the enthusiasm that people have every day for not just for this show, but for this man, they are tireless in reacting to our posts and wanting to talk about them and share their love. And I mean, I'm a fan. I loved him was, you know, greatly uh, uh, his, he had a huge impact on my life, but seeing all these people who are still interested in him um, it's just, it really makes us feel good 
And I think that's the sort of motivation for why we're doing what we're doing to try and keep him alive in a sense. I mean, Jonathan did have a personal website where he would communicate with fans. And I know the fans love that. And we can't recreate that because he's not here anymore. But this is sort of like the next best thing. So we really appreciate everybody's support. And, you know, just let us know what you'd like to see and keep, you know, responding on social media and sharing your thoughts. It's much appreciated. All right. Yeah. Be sure to go to Jonathan Frid dot org check it out uh and uh, you'll have a lot of fun uh going through the website and looking at all the exciting things on there uh and stick around because you don't want to miss the jonathan frid reading of legend of sleepy hollow so thank you again to my guests and beware the headless horseman and enjoy the legend of sleepy hollow as read by jonathan frid You have reached the MCI Halloween Hotline, and I am your host, Jonathan Frid. Let me take you on a frenzied night ride through the Valley of the Headless Horseman in Washington Irving's The Legend of Sleepy Hollow. Some say that the small valley in New York State known as Sleepy Hollow is bewitched by spirits. The most horrible of these is said to be a horseman without a head. They say he was a soldier whose head was carried away by a cannonball. His specter rides through the gloomy night air, searching for his head, and vanishes again at the bridge by the church. He is known as the Headless Horseman. Among those who had heard this tale and believed it was a tall, gangling schoolmaster by the name of Ichabod Crane. One who laughed at these ghostly tales was Brom Bones, a burly, broad-shouldered fellow, and... Ichabod's chief rival for the hand of the beautiful Katrina Van Tassel. Brahm took great delight in making Ichabod the center of many of his madcap pranks. Late on All Hallows' Eve, during a night of merriment and good food at the Van Tassel farmhouse, Ichabod, the schoolmaster, took his leave of the party and began his lonely horse ride back to town. The night grew darker and darker, and all the local stories of ghosts and goblins came crowding into Ichabod's mind. It was midnight, the witching hour, when he saw a shadowy outline beside the road, something huge, black and towering. It did not move. In the gloom, Ichabod saw that the shape appeared to be a large horseman on a powerful black horse. Then the figure moved into his path and began to ride silently next to him. Ichabod tried to pretend it wasn't there. As they reached the top of the hill, Ichabod was horror-struck when he turned and saw in the moonlight that the cloaked stranger was headless. Instead of wearing his head on his shoulders, he carried it on his saddle. Ichabod's terror rose. He kicked his horse, and away they dashed, the phantom galloping after him. He felt if he could just reach the bridge, he would be safe. Just then he heard the black steed panting closer and closer behind him. He looked back just in time to see the monster rise up in his stirrups and hurl his awful head at him. And then the monster vanished. Ichabod was never heard from again. All that remained to tell the tale were Ichabod's hat and a shattered pumpkin. And for as long as they lived, the dark shadows never truly vanished, for there will always be terror at Collinwood. Terror at Collinwood is a Penny Dreadful production.